see uh, Sanjay from his bio. He's had a, a very successful uh, career as an entrepreneur in manufacturing. He's currently the executive uh, chair of the board of MACE, uh, which is uh, here in Cleveland. A lot of people don't know that. And so in sort of EA parlance, that's like a hidden gem uh, in Cleveland, I would say. Um, previously, Sanjay uh, led Rollcraft for a number of years uh, as well. And I've known, uh, had the pleasure of knowing Sanjay for a number of years. And uh, he's a, a thought leader really in, in many areas like leadership and you know, uh, providing enhancing shareholder value. I uh, just saw uh, him uh, uh, featured in Smart Business uh, with some good ideas uh, concerning uh, business. Uh, and though not a, not, not a native Clevelander, you know, uh, Sanjay is passionate about Cleveland and we're, we're both members of the Cleveland Skating Club and I get to see him, uh, Sanjay there as well. And he's involved in many, you know, many organizations. And today Sanjay will be, you know, telling us a, a story uh, that will you know, provide lessons learned from um, a successful acquisition of a company, of a competitor, really. And uh, I think culture may have something to do with it, but I don't want to steal Sanjay's um, thunder. So I know you're going to enjoy the talk. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll pass it on over to Sanjay. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob. And thanks for having me, Don. Let me share my screen here. Can all of you see my screen? Great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is um, somewhat of a, uh, a story and I, I, I can't at the outset um, wanna say that I, you know, I'm not able to re reveal the names of the companies involved, but uh, I see some faces on the screen that they'll be, easily surmise what I'm talking about, but... Um, so let's get started. Um, got my slides all messed up here. Okay, so the background first. Um, sorry about that. I just changed devices, so. Okay, here we go. So the background is uh, we're talking about the acquisition of a, a lower middle market uh, tooling company it was smaller in size than the, the acquirer, the, the, the company that I was involved with. It had a reputation of um, a very high stickiness in terms of uh, customer retention. Uh, however, our sales guys said that the, the, the service reputation was below average, uh, if not way worse than ours. And they were certainly a, uh, a discount player. They, they came up on a radar because they were competing on price and uh, overall uh, leading to a price reduction in the marketplace. So um, we acquired them. And three years later, here, here are some of the stats that I can uh, share. When we acquired them, they were about 2% in EBITDA. We grew to 21%. We increased the on-time delivery to 92%. They didn't have a measurable prior to that, so I can't give you a baseline, but it was poor. Their uh, quality, quality. Or customer, customer satisfaction, satisfaction was uh, poor as well. And uh, we grew that to 94%. And then based on our internal enterprise value, the cash on cash return after three years was about 3.8 X. So not bad at all. So while we were considering this acquisition, you know, this sort of question seemed to come up with our team that what exactly is the problem that we are trying to solve with this acquisition. Yes, they'll add revenues, they'll add top line, maybe some profitability, acquire some customers. So we broke it down into four areas. One was the idea of 
consolidating the market share, and this was a price play. The other one was uh, shortening lead time. You know, when you're moving tooling um, and when you're repairing tooling, the kind of tooling we made, uh, even a, num a couple of days can shut down a line in terms of uh, most of our customers at the time did not want to carry any tooling on their balance sheet. Um, that's sort of uh, a trend that we had seen since 09. So, so that was an, uh, an objective. Another one was there was a, there's been a shrinking pool of talent in the CNC machining realm. And so we saw this as a way of, you know, broadening that, putting training programs in. And in fact, uh, mitigating any risks uh, for the future, because that was one of our most significant risks as we looked at our company on how we, we'd be able to fill that CNC machining uh, skill gap looking out 10 years. So we went and um, visited the operation uh, prior to the acquisition. And I took uh, my key team members and uh, it was a dreary uh, winter day. We toured the plant. The plant did not seem like it was in good shape. Uh, it wasn't very clean. Uh, not the equipment was a bit aged and uh, my ops leader said to me oh this is a slam dunk you know we'll be able to increase productivity and and bring them up to par with what we were used to um, a few weeks later uh, after we had completed due diligence and now we've acquired the company i was waiting for a plan from the oops from the uh, ops leader and he was really struggling to come up with a, a, a synergy plan uh, a gross margin improvement plan and i remember sitting down face to face with him and i said well it isn't there is there <laughs> and it was it was pretty obvious that yes the 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 baseline cost structure was pretty lean um, and it didn't look like we'd be able to move the margins that the way we thought we could. So we got together as a team and we decided to spend the following 90 days um, at the location. Uh, so I was there every almost every uh, week. And, and the idea was to really understand their competitive advantage, what they did well, because we bought them for a reason. They had a high level of customer stickiness for a reason. And, and uh, my, my objective was to solidify and, and adjust the thesis, of what we originally thought it was gonna look like. It's easy to put together these models in Excel, but in reality, when you're dealing with human beings, it's a lot different. And you know Peter Drucker famously said, "Culture eats strategy for breakfast," and we found that firsthand uh, at this company. <clears throat> One of the things that um, we realized was this company had a a very high, uh, highly skilled, tenured workforce, uh, quite stable, uh, talented, very passionate. Um, and, and again, when a competitor acquires you, there's always that tension and, and hence the reason to spend time there to get to know folks. And one of the uh, objectives that I had during the first 90 days was to get to know everyone, get to know their values, get to know what motivates them, uh, understand how the, how the company ran. And, uh, and my, my team did that as well. But I had a one-on-one -on -one with every single employee in the company. And one of the items that came up in, in the conversations in the one-to-one -one conversations was the question of how we were doing well from a profitability perspective 
versus they weren't. Uh, they saw our numbers. We, we shared it with them. Um, and, you know, the, the questions that were going through the plant, especially the plant employees was, well, how come you guys are so profitable and we aren't? And, and I sort of turned it back to them, you know, sort of using the Japanese, you know, Kaizen methodology of the Gemba walks. You walk the floor and you ask informal questions to get to know the real issues. And one of the things that came up in those one-to-ones was the idea that they, they questioned why the sales folks were in the building more than they were with their customers. Um, there was a quoting process involved, which meant that the salespeople had to be at their desks, you know, within the four walls of the building. But after once that was done and submitted, why weren't they soliciting new customers? And that led us to the realization that, that this company had a sales process problem. And so we went about redesigning the process. And that led to a few other realizations. Um, we made a list of those. We called it the not working right list. Um, and, uh, and I've written about that in smart business uh, before as well. But the, the important thing here is dialoguing with the employees. That's what sort of led us to understanding the real issues. And, and what we realized was also that their customers loved them. Um, we were the shortest lead time uh, company, but when we acquired them, their lead times were longer than ours, but their customers still wouldn't switch to us. So there were other things that they provided. And one of the other things they provided was their engineering know-how, their production know-how. When they made that tooling, it worked the very first time when it went on a mill. Um, <clears throat> so the, the objective in the first 90 days was to scrub the original thesis of a productivity play to a sales process and a, and a culture and an employee retention play. Um, a lot of people were very nervous that we would get rid of folks or lay off folks that were underperforming. And um, I remember I organized a town hall and I let everyone know that there were going to be no changes in the workforce, not knowing if I was completely right or not, but I, I did want them to feel that that was not even, you know, being evaluated in the first 90 days, maybe in the first six months, but not in the first 90 days. And then we decided to make a list of all the things that they did well and share best practices. We shared with them what we did well and, and, and shared with our team in Cleveland what these folks did well. Um, th there were a lot of challenges because the cultures were different, but I think the, the investment in the first 90 days really helped us sharpen our thesis. One of the other uh, things that I came across um, and, and our team worked really hard, especially the company that we acquired, their leadership team was to protect the baseline revenues. We, we saw some slippage as is usual when you acquire a company, people become fearful and there's an automatic sort of drop in productivity, no matter what you say, what you do, um, but we were, hell bent on protecting this, the, the, the top line. Um, after all, they were 2% EBITDA company. We couldn't have a, you know, a slippage there. Then after uh, 90 days, we also realized after studying and going through their competitive advantage study was that their uh, pricing was much lower than hours. So the, so the issue was there was no uh, question that they were lower in terms of pricing in the marketplace, but how do, we, how do we raise prices? So as we started putting measurements in place, uh, specifically on-time delivery and quality, those were the two things most important to our customers, 
Um, that took some time to get that in order. So our ops team, our continuous improvement team folks from Cleveland spent a lot of time at the uh, location to figure out how to fix those issues. But once we did that, we went ahead and started raising prices. This was a made to order tooling business. Um, so there were no customers that pushed back. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's interesting when you focus on, you know, what the customers want first, then you can go and, and you know, demand a reasonable price. Um, <clears throat> moving on, one of the other uh, items on the agenda was with all the stuff going on between figuring out the competitive advantage, getting the on-time deliveries in order, and looking at uh, all the cultural issues, uh, incentive programs, readjusting wages, uh, we had to establish a momentum. It seemed like a lot was going on. And so we, we established an annual plan, but we broke it down into quarters uh, with very clear measurable goals and then we bro broke those down into bi-weekly sort of priorities. So we could have a laser-like focus on what were the right things that needed to be worked on because there seemed to be a lot of priorities. And, and this is uh, primarily where I spent a majority of my time um, getting the team to recognize what the right priorities were. Uh, we were dealing with highly tenured folks. So it's not like you could just tell them what to do and they'd follow you. So in summary, um, if I were to summar summarize all these lessons, and then I'll open it up to Q&A because I've sort of zipped through the last uh, 14 slides. Uh, there's, there's a lot that happened, so happy to answer any questions. Um, was removing uncertainty and fear. I mean, these are basic needs of, of human beings, and you can't expect them to be productive and focused if they walk into work driving to work with, uh, you know, with that fear and uncertainty in their minds. Then protecting the top line, especially when you acquire a company with, uh, a, a, you know, razor thin EBITDA. Um, here's a lesson that seems to come up. Uh, all the deals that I've done, I, I've seen this come up a couple of times, and that is you walk in with uh, a certain idea in your mind of how the acquisition is gonna work, the problems it's gonna solve, and, it, and then other problems show up. And they're usually around culture, but this idea of having a firm thesis uh, to me just doesn't work. Uh, it's, it's open, being open to change, it, being, being able to say you're wrong or you're off and and, and changing that, figuring out ways to then go uh, hit, hit your commitments. Um, one other item that I walked away with here was uh, the idea of you know, continuous improvement, being better, making an improvement every day. And this idea of you know, being the best is a journey. And uh, you know, we do that at MACE too today. Um, and it's, it's very refreshing, it's very invigorating when you approach it that way, that you wake up in the morning and you say, well, I'm gonna learn something new and improve something new today. That's a great way to add value. And then lastly, in, in, the, in this particular acquisition, this helped us you know, shape what the industry needed. It was a very niche uh, tooling uh, uh, space. And um, this idea of being able to service our customers and uh, quite quickly and in a in a high quality fashion, uh, you know, offering a place where they could get the technical skills and knowledge and being able to solve our customers' problems, that really helped raise the standard standards in the industry. And it's something that we aspire to do at uh, at Mace as well. We just started that process, but um, that was that, that was a good lesson. Anyway, I'll, now I'll. Uh, Turn it back over to uh, you to ask questions. 
Wonderful. Um, thank you, Sanjay, for for sharing that um, and for for diving a little deep into into I think what's what's kind of a fascinating story. So, um, open it up. Does uh, who has some questions for Sanjay? Go ahead, Rob. You're on mute, I oh, think. Sanjay, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, th thanks for your great story. I'm just curious about the thesis you went in with. I understand, or I, I kind of gleaned from this, that you never really met the actual employees of the firm you're going to buy in advance of the actual purchase. So if you were to reverse that process, and interview the employees, would I have changed your thesis faster? Or would you have not even purchased a company because you found that these were very tenured employees? That's a great question. Um, I, I'll answer it this way. One is um, that was off the table. They were a competitor. They weren't going to let us, you know, uh, give us access to their employees. So we met the, uh, the president and, and two of his right-hand folks. Um, I, I think that had they allowed us to meet their employees, I mean, it would take a, uh, an expert facilitator to, to interview employees that you're about to acquire their employer and have them give you very honest answers. Um, I, I think that that takes a certain amount of skill to do that. Um, so I don't think that would have changed the story. I, I think that the, um, that's a risk you take when, when you, you know, now I've, I've walked uh, the floor at, at, with, with regards to other acquisitions and you see people with their heads down, they're working, you see other folks that are distracted. Sometimes the receptionist, you know, is a, is a, the way she acts and greets you as a visitor is a great sign. Um, I think it's always a good thing if you can meet the employees, but it's not always possible. And I think you touched upon a point that it's a very sensitive issue you had to kind of negotiate because once the rumor is out that the business is up for sale, there is no bet or no bets are up that you actually retain the employer employees uh, and it may cause some real stress. So there's a really fine line of how you go about uh, public, uh, publicizing that at the same time, making sure that the employees are intact after you do make, make the sale. So I'm sure that that you didn't talk about that, but I'm sure there was a lot of finesse that you needed in employing that tactic. We had to constantly discuss and sharpen our our, our finesse. Absolutely. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I had a question. It's a piggyback of Robert's uh, question. Was uh, the genesis of this um, uh, acquisition was it one where this was a an owner who was seeking retirement and he approached you obviously as a competitor, you acquiring this company had been on your radar for some time, but how, how, did, the, how did the approach work and was it a, uh, a company that was for sale and, 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 and hence the risk as Robert pointed out of leakage to the, um, the, the workers that the owner was retiring or had no succession plan or you know wanted to cash out? Uh, great questions, Andy. And by the way, Andy's one of the largest shareholders of Mace. So I get to answer his questions on, on shareholder calls and here as well. <laughs> so <laughs> we've become good friends. Um, yeah. So it, it was the other way around, Andy. Um, we had sued this company many, many years ago, many years ago. So I was advised not to even approach them. They were causing a pricing problem. They were showing up in our quotes, uh, underbidding us. And, and then uh, we instructed our sales folks not to lose any orders to them. So we, we kind of started playing the same game. And so we, we had to consolidate them and they were smaller but we, we didn't know if they were willing. So they took my call and I wasn't, you know, quote unquote, an outsi outsider. I didn't grow up in the industry and they, they did not want to sell. So it took about nine months. Then, then the owner came to me and said, let's talk. And, and that's how it started. And he, you think his motivation was 
he didn't have a succession plan. Obviously, no family in the business and very other very few exit um, exit uh, points. It was a question of bandwidth. It was a question of um, does the owner now invest in capital um, to to compete in an efficient manner or you know, get some money off the table and leave. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, so other questions for Sanjay. Yeah, go ahead, John. Sanjay, hi. Hi, uh, John. How you doing? Good, very good. How are you? Good. My question is also about um, what you find out ahead of the sale about the, uh, their selling process, which you later identified as uh, maybe not a strong point. And then you just explained that, um, you know, you understood it from the standpoint of their uh, coming in under price. So how, what did you understand about their sales process in your early investigation and discussions? Our understanding was that their sales process was, you know, very similar to ours. Um, but they didn't have a CRM like we did. Um, th that was one big different difference, but in the whole scheme of things, their sales force was a lot smaller, but they were a much smaller company. But the understanding was they quoted the same way like we did. They went out and visited customers the same way. So on the surface, it seemed like it was similar, but it was not until the plant folks the plant, the machinists brought it to my attention that, you know, they seem to be around a lot following up on, you know, when, when the tooling is shipping and, you know, why, why can't we, why can't we take care of it versus them having to babysit uh, them. And, and, and then when we started spending time there, we saw them in the building frequently. Um, so, so that was the, actually the biggest cultural change that we had to make with them was they were uh, account-based, relationship-based sales folks. They were not hunters. And it's not like we were gonna turn them into hunters. So, so we had to change our process where they would go out and visit a lot more, fish a lot more, and give them all the tools, including the operational excellence of deliveries and quality that that would aid their selling process. I got one quick little follow-up, which is what's the uh, time between approaching uh, a prospect and, you know, really it's a serious prospect. They want you to work on their uh, job. What's the time there between that and then actually uh, producing revenue or however that works? So for a, a hunter salesperson, probably three or four visits. For an average, probably seven. And like, is that weeks, months? Visits. It could okay. go. So yeah. You yeah. should go up Monday through Friday. <laughs> you, you can visit your <laughs> customers' prospects every other day, but yeah, whatever is practical. But yeah, I mean, you're talking about a couple of months, easy. Rick, Rick had a question for you, Sanjay. Hi, Sanjay. Um, hey, Rick. Good to see you. Good to see you. So just had a question for you in regards to culture. When you talk about bringing two different organizations together and the cultures being different and this notion of culture eating strategy you know, for breakfast makes a lot of sense. But the thing I find myself wondering is, is that if you have these two different cultures and if they're you know, your approach, let's say, would be to create uh, an environment where there could be an underlying basis of trust and to engage with people from a holistic standpoint. But if the other entity that you're acquiring doesn't have those sets of values, you know, then what, do you, what practical steps do you take in that process in order to ensure that, you know, you keep people on the floor working, doing what they're needing to do and control the risk of people heading for the exits proactively? That yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that, you know, in terms of culture, first of all, it starts at the top and it's the leadership team's job to act and behave and 
aspire to those values. And if you acquire another organization that may have some differences, uh, so be it. But you've got to live those values and you can't make anybody change. Now, if, if this company was one of, you know, through our diligence, if we found them to be so far apart in terms of how they dealt with their customers, if they were shortcutting them, things like that. We, we did dig into a lot of that. Um, and the fact that we couldn't convert any of their customers to do business with us told us that they were doing something right. And we had a pretty good idea, but it got confirmed in due diligence. But there are, in not in this case, but in other instances, we've uh, I've been part of teams, we've walked away from you know, uh, deals where we didn't feel that we could, we could really change the culture. I mean, there was way too much l heavy lifting involved. Thank you. And uh, David has a question for you, Sanjay. Hey, Sanjay. Hey, Dave. <laughs> How you doing? Um, Good. Yeah, so that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so it's like knowing what you know now um, with the deal from, from Mace, is there anything that you would have done differently or wish that you would have um, done differently if you were going to buy another company, whether it's strategy related, culture related, um, or anything like that, just knowing what happened with Mace. And then if you're looking at a, a future prospect company to buy, um, is there anything that you wish that you would have done differently with that transaction? Yeah, I'll all those things that that we did, um, I, you know, I would I would I would uh, try and move it as part of the pre-acquisition process, a pre-integration uh, process, as much as possible. Um, this one was something that took about nine months to get the the owner to come to the table, yeah. and then we had to rush it before she before she changed her mind. Um, and, and, you know, we promised her a 90 day close, which was very exciting to her. And in this particular case, being a competitor, we didn't get to see their detailed financials until the week before, uh, diligence was completed. Wow. Uh, again, just being competitors. So we couldn't see the customer list and all that. So I think that, uh, I, I the president was very nervous uh, I had to execute a, a contract. I wish I had done that. I wish I had spent a lot more time with him. Now, he wasn't able to spend a lot of time with me, but I wish I would have spent a lot of time with him and to understand what his team's needs were, what the, the cultural sort of data points were. Um, so mostly around culture. I think the sales process, those are things that, you get in and you, you find out those processes because w no matter who you ask and how you ask, it depends on the person who's explaining it to you. It's, it's coming, it's highly nuanced. So they may not speak the same language. You know, none of these folks were exposed to lean manufacturing and, and we were coming in trained in lean and, you know, asking the, those types of process questions, which they thought were a complete waste of time initially. No, that makes sense. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And Sean has a question. Go ahead, Sean. Hi, Sanjay. How are you hey, doing? Sean. How are you? Long time no see. Yeah. I, I in fact, I but I do see you everywhere on the internet and in magazines and such. And so mm -hmm. that's when I saw this uh, opportunity. I, I thought it would be great to listen. Um, I did have a question. You you had mentioned that. Um, you found the value in the in the acquisition and you were able to, you know, even though it, it took a little bit of um, being adept and, and, and sort of, you know, changing what you thought for, at the beginning. But you, you mentioned that you were able to raise the prices because you knew what was of value to these clients and that you didn't get a lot of pushback. So how did you determine what the value um, the value prop was that you knew you had the leverage to be able to raise prices. So, so that was a result of what we had done in our company before the acquisition to figure out the competitive advantage. We had done a study, uh, a double blind survey to find out what our customers wanted <clears throat> from their suppliers. And they confirmed it, that that's what their customers wanted. Although 
on-time delivery was a requirement, although they felt that quality was number one and delivery was second. That was not what our survey showed. Um, so that was part of the heavy lifting that we had to do to, to help them not just understand that those two things were important, but to show them the gaps through a lean and continuous improvement process where their gaps were. At the end of the day, the, the, their president got a clear view of what his gross margins could look like if he fixed the issues. And part of it involved productivity, efficiency. It, it involved taking a less amount of time to make the tooling and hence shortening the lead time. So part of this again was a behavioral cultural sort of play. Um, and again, you, you can't direct a 55 year old to do exactly what you need them to do. Uh, it, you know, I mean, you can have a prescription, but uh, there are other ways. So it, most of it is if, if people realize that you care about them, you care about their needs, it's more about that, then they'll, they're more likely to follow your, your path, but you also have to earn their trust. And so our team spending a lot of time there, that, that made a massive difference. That told them we cared. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you're you. welcome. Right, other, yeah, Leanne, go ahead. Um, I have a question and Sanjay, I love your comments. Um, I work in executive search. So a lot of times I'm the one that gets the calls from the people that have been acquired that aren't happy. And there's always, you know, in certain senior jobs, there's only one person that gets the nod and somebody else doesn't. So what was the process you used around the transition, the succession and the retention of those key players that you wanted? And then how did you behave toward those that you wanted to be gone so those remaining didn't feel like you weren't fair to them or something like that? Uh, that was easy. We, we, our plans were not to touch them. At all, so ever. Wow. Well, not ever, but oh, okay. so, I mean, not knowing, uh, I mean, that, that's the town hall where once I got from the, my one-to-ones, people were really nervous. Okay. I mean, I'll give you an example. So I'm having a one-to-one -one and they walk into the office, a makeshift office, and they close the door and I asked them to leave it open. And they said, well, aren't you going to talk to me about what you want to do with me? I said, no, I want to, I want to hear, you know, what, how, how you can help us. You know, and, and, and so <clears throat> the, I had to make the call. And I, so I organized a town hall and I made the call and I announced to everyone, just do your thing. Um, I left it to the, up to the local uh, president to tell me who he thought should not be there or who was underperforming. And we had two people that were, um, they, they were close to retirement. Um, and, and one unfortunately got sick and he died. Um, but they were both very close to retirement. So yeah, so nobody was um, laid off or anything like that. Well, that's, that's the opposite of what you normally hear. Uh, yeah, this was a technical know-how play as well. Uh, that's a really big deal. It, it's not that easy to get somebody trained up in this kind of business. And, you know, like high tolerance machining. Uh, to me, that was the biggest risk that the company was facing looking out 10 years, uh, just given the, the, what, what was going on in the workforce. So, I, yeah, so that was very, I paid close attention to that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Go ahead, Andrew. So this acquisition that you presented was of a competitive, a competitor for a platform that you have already owned, okay? I'm, I'm just wondering um, if you can share, I mean, it's been enough time under the wall, under, under, the, under the bridge that when you acquired your um, a large minority, but effective controlling position in MACE, that was the acquisition of a brand new platform. And I, and I don't know to what extent Ancora in negotiating the sale of half of its block to you um, was 
uh, able to provide or you mutually got the company to provide, but how, to what extent you had um, due diligence like you've described here in this whole process in your acquisition of, a, we'll call it a brand new platform and determining um, the opportunities and advantages and um, value um, added goals that you had um, to put in place in your acquisition of uh, MACE? Yeah, so MACE had uh, very little to do with the other sort of platform. This was the, the, the only <clears throat> sim similarity in the, in the play with MACE was it's a great brand name. And uh, I was, during diligence, the question, one of the most significant questions I was trying to answer was, you know, what, what was the root cause of the problem why this company was losing $2 million? And I mean, was it a product? Was it, you know, operations? Well, it all pointed to focus and, you know, essentially leadership. But I mean, if you drill down a little bit more, it was focus and discipline. And, and we felt that we could, you know, we could make a play of it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a $500 million company with 28 plants. It was small enough that, you know, with some sort of process improvement and focus and discipline, you know, we could make a, we could make a good play there. And it played out well in 2020, as you know. Other questions for Sanjay from anybody? Sanjay, this is Matthew Hansen. Fabulous presentation. Thanks for sharing. I do have Thank two. You, One of them is, um, what was the biggest surprise that you had as a result of your cultural change? And secondly, if you could do it all over again, what would you have done differently? So, uh, I'll offer three comments on the, uh, the, the, the day the transaction closed, um, a, a team of us flew into the city where, uh, where this company was based. Uh, we had worked out a script with the owner of what uh, she was gonna tell the employees. And then I had a script based on, we had, we, we had sort of worked it out. So we show up, um, and uh, after the papers are signed, the, she, she organizes a meeting. And I don't think anyone expected that. Um, and then she said, here are the new owners. That was the extent of her script. She went off script completely. And part of it was, it was an emotional thing. But the other part of it was, I think she, um, and I became good friends with her. So she shared with me that, she just, she just wanted it to be over, period. And um, <laughs> so, so I had this script and I, and, I, and I put the little piece of paper back in my pocket and I had to come up with a couple of, you know, bullet points immediately. And, I, and that's when we just said, well, let's all go back to work and, you know, we'll, we'll be out here for a few weeks and and they were quite surprised. And there was one, uh, their uh, plant manager at the time, he came into the boardroom and he said that he was going to resign. And we asked him to stay on and he's still there. But um, <clears throat> so, so in terms of um, what I would have done differently, probably spent a lot more time with the with their leadership team uh, prior to the acquisition. Uh, the owner really fought that. She, she had given us limited access, but I, I think we could have probably done a much better job of sort of weighing in. Um, in terms of you know what what transpired from a cultural perspective, I, I think the plant employees offering the solutions was the biggest takeaway for me. Mm -hmm. And it was one where, it, you know, if people are allowed to be in a safe zone and they are trusted and you trust them, they know the answers. It, they may have a very different language, 
you have to build on it. But they'll give you those little nuggets that you can build on. And, and as part of the leadership team, you have to connect the dots. But their languaging was all pointing to the sales process that I that I, you know, identified earlier. And so I think I think that was a huge takeaway. And uh, clearly, to your credit and the credit of your team, that you not only asked the questions but you waited around to listen for the answers. So it, I mean, it strikes me that that was the thing that made the difference in the success of the acquisition. Um, and that's not easily done, so to your credit. We had a lot of internal debate about, you know, moving things fast. And I don't know, it was just one of those gut feelings and you don't know if you're right. Right. Uh, you can enjoy the results of it afterwards. I can speak about it now. At that time, no, I didn't know. Nice job. Thank you. So before um, before we we do some some breakout room networking, uh, I did want to introduce and and uh, turn it over a little bit to um, Rob Felber. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Rob is the chairperson of the EA. So um, Rob, in in between uh, fire calls, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Don, and and thank sure. you, Sanjay. I apologize, I couldn't be here for the opening, but. Uh, I know you are in good hands with Councillor Gilmore. Uh, welcome to uh, those I don't know that I have not had the pleasure of meeting and, uh, and some nice returning faces to see uh, as well. Uh, I believe Dawn's already shared with you uh, upcoming programming. And uh, I just wanted to say a quick hello and, uh, and I'm not sure if he introduced Mark Rashan, who uh, is the vice chair of the organization. And, uh, and then thanks to uh, the programming committee once again that Mr. Gilmore sits on as I do as well for uh, continually bringing us great programming. And uh, from what I heard, it was, it was very informative and probably some of the best questions. So um, if, uh, if you can take a look at our website, Dawn has posted in the chat, the uh, link to all of our events, you can book them right into your calendar right now with the Zooms and, and get them on your calendar. Um, and they're all individual links. So go ahead and do that. And uh, I welcome anybody's feedback and, and questions uh, Offline, I'll turn it over to Dawn. I believe you're going to handle breakouts. Yes. Um, yeah. So.